A very good evening to all the participants of Rehabilitation Science Group YouTube channel. Today uh, with you, I am Harpreet Singh, uh, presenting the first part of the four part series on functional electrical stimulation and its clinical application to stroke rehabilitation. So as a beginner module, I would be discussing on the introduction to therapeutic electrical currents because on these electrical currents is the premise of functional electrical stimulation based. So this will be uh, an introduction to beginners who are starting to use or be beginning to use uh, functional electrical stimulation and want to understand uh, the basic uh, physiology behind the equipment uh, and in the application of, and its role in the application okay. of rehabilitation. So, uh, in its introduction to functional electrical stimulation, we will divide the lecture into three parts, uh, which will be why to use FES, uh, what is there in the FES, and how do we use uh, FES. So the three aspects, as we know in FES, are the functional, uh, electrical, and the stimulation aspect. Now, since it is a physical modality or an electrophysical modality, I must make this clear from the beginning uh, that the American Physical Therapy Association has given a policy guideline that states uh, that these modalities should only be used as a component of patient management. So uh, any modality or electrical agent that we use in rehabilitation itself uh, may not be an isolated comprehensive uh, management or treatment option, uh, but it must be anchored with other rehabilitation agents, uh, most commonly uh, the exercise or the physical aspect of rehabilitation. Now, coming to the electrical aspect of functional electrical stimulation, which says uh, that we use electrical currents in functional electrical stimulation. Now, when we talk of using electrical currents, we are talking about uh, electrical charge transferred to the body. Now, whenever an electrical charge is transferred to the body, uh, it acts physiologically on the system, on, on the tissues uh, where the electrical charge is delivered. Now, every electrical charge delivered to the body would create or produce physiological changes, which may or may not be beneficial uh, that you can call them to be therapeutic. So for any electrical stimulation to be therapeutic or beneficial, uh, that is uh, when we talk of rehabilitation signs, we are talking of correcting the impairments. We are talking about uh, changing the patient's status or uh, bringing about improvement uh, in the problems that our patients face. So every electrical charge given to the body may not be therapeutic. So there have to be changes uh, that are made in electrical currents to not only produce changes, but to produce beneficial changes in the human tissues. For example, uh, the well-known effects of electrical currents in the peripheral tissues of the body, especially the muscle is, since we are talking about the neuromuscular system and the role of FES, on the muscle, uh, the electrical stimulation is, is known to increase the oxidative capacity of the muscle. That is, uh, the muscle works uh, more efficiently, uh, more prolonged work of the muscle uh, happens after training with electrical stimulation. Uh, there is increase in the number of microcapillaries. And also what has been seen is the muscle fibers uh, are transformed from 
uh, type two to type one, type one to type two, depending on uh, the properties of the electrical currents that are uh, delivered to the muscle. Apart from these, uh, whenever an electrical current is given to the muscle, it produces joint range of motion, just like uh, any other active range of motion or passive range of motion exercise delivered by the therapist. So whatever effects a movement can produce, beneficial effects a movement can produce on the body, the same can be achieved through electrical stimulation. For example, improving control and strength improving joint range of motion and thereby impacting uh, or changing the functional capacity. Now, when I say using electrical currents of the tissues, we are mainly focusing on uh, the neuromuscular system. Now, these are the excitable uh, tissues within the human body and uh, a very important and the basic properties of this tissue is uh, the presence of resting membrane potential. That is, unlike many other tissues or organs, uh, the cells in the neuromuscular system maintain a negative potential even at rest, even though this requires expenditure of energy, uh, but this is how the state is maintained uh, in a constant alertness, or you can say uh, at a readiness level of action. So uh, at, at minus 70 millivolt of resting membrane potential is maintained uh, at a resting nerve or a resting muscle, which may be uh, nearby the same potential. Now, whenever an electric charge is applied, uh, depending on the polarity of the charge, uh, this resting membrane may be altered due to an external input that is in this case an electrical current. Now, there is a possibility of either raising the potential or to reduce the potential. So whenever uh, from minus 70, we go towards zero, uh, that is said to be going towards depolarization. So any current or any charge uh, that makes the uh, potential move towards zero uh, is uh, trying to uh, depolarize the nerve or you can say uh, create an action potential or produce a response to the stimulus. So whenever you want the neuromuscular system to respond, uh, we would like to give a charge that takes this resting membrane potential from minus 70 towards zero. And we do not have to, a lot of times, we do not have to give current up till zero, uh, but to a certain threshold level beyond which uh, the action potential uh, takes up over and uh, the depolarization uh, is a self, uh, what do you say, continuous process and on its own, uh, it uh, produces depolarization and repolarization. So as you can see in the picture, uh, the action potential needs to reach a threshold point, as you can see, which is uh, 10 to 15 millivolts above minus 70. So even with minimal currents, as you can see in this picture, uh, there are currents uh, which are present, but they may not reach the threshold. So once the current reaches a threshold, the depolarization and the repolarization become an automatic process. Whenever the current depolarizes the nerve, uh, there is a certain order to the recruitment of motor units as well as muscle fibers. So, uh, in normal physiological human actions, what the human body produces a movement is by recruitment of type one uh, muscle fibers first, and which is followed by intermediate and type two uh, muscle fibers. And this comes whenever uh, we are near exhaustion or near fatigue level what happens with an electrically induced muscle contraction. So uh, whenever there is a voluntary physiological muscle contraction, this is 
physiologically initiated contraction, uh, the muscle fibers which are recruited first are the slow twitch type one fibers. Whereas uh, on electrically induced muscle contraction, it is the type two fast twitch fibers which are recruited first. And if you see uh, the properties of these two muscle fibers, uh, the type one is fatigue resistant, whereas the type two fatigues quickly. So whenever we are providing an electrical current to generate muscle contraction, the fast fatiguing or the tiring muscle fibers are recruited first. This is a big limitation in two ways. Uh, the first is uh, whenever an action is learned with the help of electrical currents, this is the order in which the muscle um, contraction is learned. So this order of recruitment and pattern of recruitment of motor nerve fibers and the muscle fibers is generally re reversed. It is known as the reversed recruitment order with an electrical current. Now coming to the components of generating electrical current. Now there are two types of stimulators that we can use. Uh, the first type of stimulator to be used with FES is known as the constant voltage stimulator. Okay, now constant voltage stimulators are preferably used uh, with non-invasive functional stimulators. Uh, that is, uh, when, it, when the application of FES is transcutaneous. Uh, these are safe currents, uh, but the problem with these type of currents is that the current may vary uh, depending on the skin impedance, uh, depending on uh, the uh, moistness between the electrode and the skin, or depending on the tissues. If it changes during the period of stimulation, the current may vary. So, uh, it is not a very dependable output uh, uh, with constant voltage stimulators, but still they are preferred because they are safe. Uh, the number two or the second type of stimulators used with FES are the constant current stimul stimulators. Uh, since, as I said, constant current stimulators are dependable in their output, that is the current uh, remains constant that stimulates the muscle. So because they are more dependable, uh, they are the choice of stimulators being used whenever the FES is invasive or implanted. Number two is the type of electrodes that we use. Uh, now the type of electrodes that we use are either invasive or non-invasive depending on the mode of uh, functional electrical stimulator that we use. Now, uh, very clearly it says uh, that the non-invasive uh, stimulation does have its benefit. And the most uh, important and the most common benefit is that it is inexpensive. And number two, uh, it does not require uh, any surgical intervention uh, for the electrodes to be implanted uh, in the body. Uh, whereas the invasive may require uh, surgical options, but uh, whenever the patient uh, needs um, uh, the use of functional stimulation for a longer period of time, uh, and uh, the disease or the condition uh, may be either uh, non-progressive or unlikely to change, uh, sometimes uh, invasive electrodes are preferred. Now, as you know, uh, whenever the electrical currents are applied over the skin, uh, the electrical currents have to pass the skin. Now, whenever a current is applied to the skin, the sensory nerves are, are also stimulated or activated. So there is a limit uh, to the intensity that we can give the current with non-invasive stimulation. Uh, that is, uh, if I increase the intensity of the current too high, uh, it may become uncomfortable or painful on the skin. Whereas uh, this problem uh, is overcome with invasive electrodes. That is, you bypass the skin sensation 
or uh, the pain or uncomfortable uh, current sensation on uh, the skin. So uh, another very important point to remember with invasive and non-invasive is that uh, whenever you are using transcutaneous that is over the skin electrodes, uh, it is hard to reach deeper muscles. Uh, it is hard to stimulate smaller muscle fibers uh, because they may need larger intensity or amount of current uh, when compared to the superficial uh, or the large motor units, uh, which can be overcome uh, by uh, the use of invasive electrode. Uh, very, very often it is uh, obvious uh, that uh, we cannot uh, highly localized uh, stimulation uh, over the skin, whereas uh, even uh, invasive stimulation can be highly localized uh, and can also stimulate the deeper muscles or deeper tissues. Uh, the third component of the machine is the sensor. Now the sensor is a device that acts as a switch. Now these type of sensors can be uh, gravity responsive that is in alteration to position of the body part with respect to gravity. Uh, these could be time uh, dependent or uh, these could be pressure sensitive. So whenever the pressure on the sensor changes, uh, it acts like an on off switch. So uh, something like uh, the moment I relieve the pressure on the sensor, uh, that time the machine is switched on. And uh, in the next phase, as soon as uh, the sensor is put pressure on, uh, the, machine may, uh, the machine switches off uh, the stimulating input. Uh, apart from this, uh, electromyographic controlled sensors uh, and uh, other type of sensors are also available. Now these sensors can either be uh, patient controlled movement controlled or even the therapist controlled. Now, uh, when we talk of the machine, uh, we talk of the components of the machine, we talk of the electrical currents, but until and unless, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, every electrical current may not be therapeutic or beneficial. So apart from these components of functional electrical stimulation, uh, we might also need appropriate stimulus parameters. Now, this is what we are going to discuss is how is the stimulation designed? Uh, electrical stimulation is designed to produce a therapeutic benefit to the neuromuscular system and ultimately to um, uh, regain the lost functions. So first is to stimulate, we need an excitable tissue. And as we discussed, uh, we are talking about the neuromuscular system, uh, which is an excitable tissue. So the requirement for electrical, functional electrical stimulation is an intact lower motor neuron. Intact lower motor neuron means uh, down the anterior horn cell through the peripheral nerve, the neuromuscular junction to the muscle, uh, the network should be intact and uh, denied of or lack of any pathology. Uh, so although uh, we do not stimulate the muscle directly, but still uh, we require a healthy muscle uh, so that whenever uh, the motor point or the peripheral nerve is stimulated, uh, the effector, uh, the reactive organ or the muscle tissue should be healthy to respond uh, to these electrical currents. Now, the disadvantage of using muscle directly for stimulation is, number one, uh, a larger intensity of current is required to stimulate the muscle. And many times as we increase the intensity of current, it becomes uncomfortable. And while learning or motor learning, uh, when a functional electrical stimulation is given for longer time, uh, this produces uh, long-term uncomfortable uh, sensory input. Uh, and secondly, it may lead to muscle fatigue also.
So we do not prefer to stimulate the muscle, uh, but the motor point or the peripheral nerve. So this highly excludes the patients with diseases of the anterior horn cell, uh, like poliomyelitis, uh, like amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or motor neuron disease. Uh, we might also have to include um, patients with radiculopathy or nerve compression, uh, patients who have uh, uh, any peripheral nerve injury uh, or, uh, after trauma. Uh, so such patients with any lower motor neuron pathology need to be included. And this also includes patients with uh, myopathies or muscle diseases. Now, depending on uh, the beneficial stimulator parameters, we first have to identify uh, the waveform of a current. Now, as you can see in this picture, uh, depending on the phases of the current, a current may be monophasic or biphasic. As you can see, uh, the current may have one phase uh, and another phase. So uh, the, this is called uh, a biphasic uh, stimulus, and this is called a monophasic stimulus. Now, depending on uh, if the biphasic stimulus, which is very much preferred in electrical stimulations, which are uh, provided to the neuromuscular system and for a longer time, uh, because of the reversal of electrochemical changes uh, as the polarity of the current is reversed. Uh, the waveform can be symmetrical. That is both the phases may be symmetrical or uh, they may be asymmetrical. Uh, and as you can see, area uh, under the curve may be different. So the balance uh, of positive and negative phase may be equal or unequal. And this is selected according to uh, the type or the response that is required from the neuromuscular system. But uh, a lot of times we do prefer uh, biphasic symmetrical waveforms. And uh, uh, if you see, uh, there are certain parameters or characteristics of pulse currents that, uh, that we need to adjust or set depending on the patient. Uh, the first is the amplitude. Amplitude means the intensity of current uh, that is uh, provided to the tissues. Uh, that is the magnitude of the charge. Uh, this relates to the depth of penetration of electrical current. That means more the amplitude, more the intensity, the deeper the current can go. So whenever you need to stimulate deeper tissues or the muscle that is uh, or the nerve that is going to be stimulated lies deep, uh, the current intensity have to be higher. Uh, as already discussed, a lot of times higher currents become uncomfortable at the skin. So uh, the deeper the penetration, the more the muscle fiber recruitment is possible. So uh, we tend to use as high intensity tolerable as possible so that uh, the muscle fibers uh, are recruited in large numbers. So uh, through this picture, what you can see is uh, the current density uh, is much more at the surface as compared to the distance between the lines as the current reaches distally. So the superficial effects of the current between the electrodes and under the electrodes is much more uh, than as it passes uh, distal or uh, deeper into the tissues. So uh, the current density is highest at the surface and diminishes uh, in deeper tissues. So based on amplitude, uh, sometimes the currents uh, as soon as they are perceptible to the patient or as soon as the patient starts feeling uh, the initiation of current, that is known as the sensory threshold of the current. Uh, as soon as the patient learns about uh, the presence of electrical stimuli, at that point or that intensity is known as the sensory threshold. Uh, as soon as uh, 
muscle contraction is visible or initiates even though the range of motion or the joint movement may not be there uh, but as you can palpate or you can see the muscle fibers contracting uh, that initiation electrical input or amplitude is known as the motor threshold and sometimes full movement neuromuscular electrical stimulation is used that is the intensity is selected such that whenever the muscle contracts uh, we expect a full uh, range of motion from the contracting muscle so uh, from this picture what you can see is a stimulation just at the level of threshold of the muscle as i said threshold means uh, the initiation of recruitment of nerve or muscle fibers now this is when uh, the closest uh, fibers uh, or the largest fibers are recruited first as uh, the current intensity is increased from threshold to a higher level we discussed that as the magnitude of electrical current is increased uh, the number of fibers uh, are recruited more uh, the fibers which are farther away from the electrode also uh, starts to be recruited Uh, the next parameter that we see is the duration the pulse duration uh, it is the length of time that the electrical flow is on uh, this is also known as pulse width uh, now based on this pulse duration so as we have discussed that uh, the intensity or the amplitude of the current is important uh, similarly the duration of the electrical current is equally important because Uh, this determines which tissue is stimulated uh, we know that uh, uh, slow uh, that that is uh, the pulses which are uh, slow initiating and long duration uh, may not stimulate certain type of uh, tissues uh, number 2 uh, pulses uh, uh, with shorter duration and larger intensity may not be very comfortable so there is a range of uh, uh, pulse duration that is from 300 uh, microseconds uh, to 1000 microseconds that are that is within the comfortable range and this is what is selected for uh, stimulation uh, sometimes uh, when you are stimulating a muscle and the response in certain pathological conditions is not achieved to the level that is expected or desired Uh, we have the parameter of increasing the intensity of the current to reach the desired uh, output uh, which may become uncomfortable so in this case uh, if you increase the duration of uh, the current keeping the intensity below uh, the maximum uh, the same result can be achieved because the charge delivered to the muscle remains the same so uh, either you increase the intensity or you increase the pulse duration uh, whenever we are trying to achieve muscle contraction a very important uh, parameter is the pulse rise time that is the time uh, the current takes to reach the peak intensity Uh, or ramp the ramping up so uh, it is the rapid rising pulses as you can see this rectangular waveform below the rapid rise of current uh, this pulse these are the pulses which are uh, used for generally nerve uh, depolarization or stimulating the nerve uh, there could be some pulses which slowly rise uh, to the peak now slowly rise may be more comfortable uh, to the skin but sometimes the tissues may get accommodated so if the patient uh, uh, patient comes to you with uncomfortable sensations uh, then you may choose an electrical current that rises slowly so, so the rise time uh, can be reduced but Uh, the better contraction can be achieved with rapid rising pulses so uh, 
uh, with slow rise currents, the shock of the current is reduced. Uh, the last parameter that we need to uh, modulate or select, uh, you should know about the pulse frequency, uh, that is the hertz uh, of the current. That is how many pulses occur per unit of time, generally calculated as pulses per second. Okay, so when we are talking of the low frequency currents for neuromuscular stimulation, uh, generally these are below 1000 hertz. So below 1000 hertz, uh, so every input uh, may not be beneficial for muscle stimulation. So the range at which a muscle generally is stimulated is between 10 to 20 hertz, uh, where we get the continuous contraction from the muscle. Uh, so between this 10 to 30 hertz, I would say, uh, that a continuous or a tetanic contraction of muscle or a smooth contraction of the muscle should be achieved or can be achieved. Anything below 10 hertz uh, would appear to be an uh, discontinuous or incontinuous uh, muscle stimulation. Uh, now I'll show you through a small video uh, that you can see uh, whenever an electrical current is applied below uh, 10 hertz, you can very clearly see or visualize uh, that the muscle's contraction is not continuous. And you can see the breaking or, or the relaxing and contraction of the muscle. Whereas when you see this picture, uh, as the electrical current is provided, the muscle is continuous. The stimulus appears without any fluctuations, without any uh, up and down movement. So these type of stimulations are preferable. Now, since we have discussed the electrical currents, we have discussed the stimulation parameters. The last part in the first or the introductory module is the functional aspect. Now, functional electrical stimulation preferably is used uh, or indicated to replace a movement or to assist or supplement a weak movement. Now replace this movement uh, with function. Uh, so either we replace a function and in that case, when we are replacing a function, uh, the functional electrical stimulator is known as a neuroprosthesis. So just like any other prosthesis, uh, it is worn. That means the patient wears the machine and it stays with the patient for, you say the waking time, like three hours, four hours or six hours, even after the training is over. Uh, and a lot of times it is used to assist or supplement a function. So how do we do it? Uh, because uh, stimulating a single muscle produces a movement, uh, produces uh, an action at a joint or a muscle. Uh, so for recreating or simulating a function, uh, we have to coordinate several effectors or outputs through the stimulator, uh, which contract in a specific sequence uh, that recreate the muscle activity required for a particular function or a task. So uh, that means whenever an electrical stimulus is applied and that electrical stimulus achieves the desired task or function is important uh, when compared to a passive electrical stimulation with no voluntary effort from the patient. Therefore, uh, when you call an electrical stimulation to be functional is whenever that electrical stimulation is synchronized with task practice. Now, this is seen uh, that functional electrical stimulation when compared to a normal electrical stimulation uh, where the patient is passive and not voluntarily participating uh, in the electrical stimulation, uh, the cortical excitability uh, within the brain of the body part or the tissues was higher with FES when compared to the uh, 
passive stimulation. Now, these are two uh, very good examples in front of you. As you can see, we just see, saw this, uh, an electrical stimulus uh, producing uh, a movement at the wrist, uh, say the wrist extensor movement without any functional consequence of the movement except that the movement is produced. Within the second uh, picture or the picture below, what you can see is uh, the patient engaging in a functional task of placing the cup from the mouth to the table uh, using eccentric or contraction uh, of certain muscles. Uh, so uh, electrical stimulation is combined with task practice. So the normal uh, neuromuscular electrical stimulation was not very popular due to efficacy issues uh, because the movements were repeated, movements were pre uh, produced with electrical currents, but there was no active participation or problem solving from uh, the participant or the subject. Uh, whereas uh, functional electrical stimulation uh, does involve task practice or production of function, uh, which may involve problem solving, uh, creating a change in the motor learning and re-educating of functional goals. So where if you have to create a checklist, uh, number one, does the electrical stimulation provide feedback? Number two, is it repetitive? Number three, is it of sufficient intensity and number four, is it task oriented? So if you see the difference, uh, the, in some stimulation, stimulations, uh, patient may become a passive recipient of electrical current with no cognitive involvement or investment from the patient. Uh, you have also seen biofeedback mediated electrical stimulation where a patient partially activates a muscle and rest of the stimulation is taken over by the equipment. So patient has to participate and activate part of the contraction. So uh, when compared to passive stimulation, th there is a greater cognitive investment uh, from the side of the patient. Whereas uh, in functional electrical stimulation, uh, the, there is a meaningful context repetitive training and the involvement of a sensor or a switch, uh, which does uh, require active participation from the patient in some form or the other. So electrical stimulation, uh, what we have seen may have peripheral effects on the muscle tissue, something like uh, changing, in, changing the muscle fiber types, uh, changing the oxidative capacity of the muscle or increasing the micro capillaries within the muscle. But uh, the changes with stimulation are many times beyond the muscle uh, just by adding a volitional task specific training in addition to uh, the electrical stimulation. And this may enhance uh, activity dependent plasticity in patients who uh, are not able to generate uh, functional movements or activity specific muscle contraction because of weakness or complications after uh, neurological pathologies like stroke. So uh, what differentiates functional electrical stimulation is, uh, there is artificial activation of the paretic or the weak muscles by electrical stimulation of the intact lower motor neurons, but the difference is during functional, meaningful tasks uh, activated by the patient. Now, uh, everything is not so rosy, uh, but there could be certain contraindications. And as a therapist, you have to be careful in use of electrotherapy because functional electrical stimulation uh, uses electrical currents. So in patients with cardiac disability, in patients who are using pacemakers of any kind uh, in uh, uh, pregnancy, uh, uh, during the time of menstruation, over uh, the abdomen, 
or the lumbar or pelvic region uh, over uh, or near the cancerous lesions uh, near the sites of scars, uh, lines, uh, that is the IV line or uh, drainage uh, at the place of hemorrhage or active thrombosis over implanted stimulators, metal implants, surgical repairs, uh, nerve sensitivity or over the eye, uh, there are certain restrictions to the use of uh, electrical currents and uh, we should respect uh, these things. Uh, thank you uh, for this uh, brief uh, presentation to the introduction of uh, electrical currents uh, before uh, we go on to the application of these electrical currents uh, in stroke population. Thank you.